the message that I'm going to talk about today is uh, concerning and connected to the message that I preached here, uh, I guess it was a month and a half ago, two months ago, on Daniel chapter 9 and the 70 weeks prophecy. It's connected. It's not about that. And in that message, we talked about how Daniel chapter 9 and the 70 week prophecy was completely fulfilled in Jesus in the first century rather than the futurist interpretation that throws the 60, uh, 70th week off way into the future yet to be fulfilled. This, uh, I didn't, I had spoke a lot about that subject uh, in detail in that message, but I believe that I gave you enough information to prove that the Bible and versus the futurist interpretation of that are in the futurist interpretation is wanting, it's lacking, it doesn't line up with what the Bible teaches. In this message I'm going to discuss a very controversial chapter in Scripture and that is Matthew 24. And uh, we're going to spend the entire two messages in that chapter and we're going to break down between verse 1 and verse 34. And, uh, of course, this chapter is connected with Daniel chapter 9 because Jesus references Daniel chapter 9 and the abomination of desolation and the prophecy in this passage. Now, in this message, um, it's also, this chapter is also known as the Olivet Discourse, or even some people call it the mini-apocalypse, uh, the mini-book of Revelations. And we're going to break that down, too. But before looking at uh, chapter 24, I would like to talk about three schools of prophetic interpretation. Only three, because there's many, many more, but there's three that I want us to outline before we go into this message. That way, you all better have an idea of where we're going with this and how other people view this passage. First one being futurism, uh, which is what your, most of your Judeo-Christian churches believe and teach. And... Um, they teach that chapter 4 through 19 of the book of Revelation is off in the future, never is still to be fulfilled, and that most of Matthew chapter 24 and 25 has not been fulfilled. Uh, none of it. Um, very, very little. Some of them will say that the temple was destroyed in that passage, and others even throw that off in there. Almost all Judeo Christians teach this and in fact Judeo Christianity and the Israelite state wouldn't even be in existence if it wasn't for this interpretation. They um, in fact the futurist, the dispensationalist were very responsible for the setting up of the state of Israel that we know today over there in the Middle East. Uh, that's a whole other history but they were very connected with the development of that. The term futurism is often found as a part of a longer title called Dispensational Pre-Trib Rapture Futurism. And then, you know, a lot of people use the futurism. It's a mouthful. This is not an old teaching. It is actually rather new. You know, you would not find a Dispensational Pre-Trib Rapture Futurist 200, 300 years ago. Uh, it was not a very popular doctrine. In fact, it wasn't until about 130 years ago that it really became a thing. Um, you will not find futuristic teachings in the early church doctrine or anything like that. Uh, not the way they teach it. Um, it was Ca Catholic Jesuit Roberta who presented this doctrine at first. Uh, he presented it and made it flourish. And then, of course, it was uh, C.I. Schofield and John Darby that made it popular. C.I. Schofield put it in his popular uh, study Bible in the early 1900s. And then it blossomed into this big menagerie of false doctrine from there. Um, Roberta, the Jesuit that uh, first introduced this, um, introduced it during the 1500s during the Counter-Reformation. Um, because the historicist had an interpretation of the Catholic Church that was not very kind to the Catholic Church. Uh, and the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuits and the Catholics had to come up with something to, to counter this bad rap because they were losing members, they were losing money, uh, there was a revolution going on. And uh, they had to battle it somehow. 
So you had what, the Counter-Reformation, and we're still kind of in the Counter-Reformation -Re right now. In fact, now you have, quote, Protestant churches now reforming back to the Catholic Church and the, their teachings. They may not do it openly, but if you start examining their teachings, it's very, very close to what the Catholic Church has been teaching. Then we have the second interpretation of prophecy, uh, historicism, which, this is a summary, teaches that the prophecies in the book of Revelation have been unfolding over the last 2,000 years and continue to unfold, and that revelation, the revelation given to the Apostle John was a history of things to happen between the time it was given and the time of Jesus Christ's second return, or final return, however you want to put it. When Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 says, these things, quote, these things which must shortly come to pass, doesn't mean these things shall shortly become fulfilled, but rather these things shall shortly start unfolding, start happening. And they did. Um, it, it does not say they shall shortly all be fulfilled, no matter how you twist it. Uh, it says they shall shortly come to pass. So this interpretation of prophecy would line up with that scripture. It's worth noting that all the reformers, the Protestant reformers, were historicists such as Martin Luther, Matthew Pole, John Calvin, John Knox, William Tyndale, and many others. In fact, all the men that were responsible for having this Bible were historicists. Then you have preterism or full preterist. Preterism. Or some people call it uh, fulfilled Bible prophecy. Some, they get upset if you use the wrong term or whatever. But basically it means that you believe that everything, the full preterist view, everything in the Bible is fulfilled. Jesus came back in 70 A.D. The resurrection of the dead happened in 70 A.D. There's nothing in this Bible that's left over. Everything's happened. And... Uh, the second coming was in 70 A.D. And um, the Matthew 24 was just a shorter version of Revelation. So Jesus stated what He did in Matthew 24, and then He felt the need to have a revelation to John and then explain it in more complicated prophetic detail, only for them to, according to the Preterists, the book of Revelation was written around 68 A.D. So you only had two, three years for it to make any relevance to anybody there and then travel amongst the Mediterranean and the churches to, to be read before 70 A.D. Um, preterism was first introduced by a Catholic Jesuit, Louis D. Alcazar. Excuse me. Alcazar. Another Jesuit. During the Counter-Reformation to yet again counter the historicist point of view of the Catholic Church, which wasn't very kind to the Catholic Church. They, uh, the preterism, they teach that us Christians, through preaching of the gospel and evangelizing the whole earth over time, will establish the kingdom and it will continue to grow. Preterists are very big on evangelizing, which I agree with. I mean, they're right. We should grow. We shouldn't just box ourselves in and, and not be the, the stone, the little pebble that filled the whole earth. I agree with them on that. They're right. Uh, we shouldn't be like the futurists and just wait for Jesus to come back and fix everything. Uh, this is something we are to be doing, whether we're a preterist or not. Uh, I think Colonel Jack Moore said it best in his book, To Deceive the Elect, The Rapture Factor Fiction. He says this, quote, There have been more soldiers of the cross neutralized and turned into panty waist sissy britches, religious cowards by the teaching of this heresy, speaking of futurism, than by any other weapon which the enemy has ever used against us in modern times. For instance, inst excuse me, for instance of being on the battle line where they belong, most of these Christians are hiding in their comfortable air-conditioned spiritual foxholes, folding their hands in prayer while they ask God to handle the dirty work He gave them to do and rescue them for the mess caused by their apathy. Jesus was talking about religious folks like this when He said in Matthew 5, 13, Ye are the salt of the earth. But when the salt has lost its savor, or the ability to, or the ability to act like salt and hold back corruption, it is good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of man. 
End quote. We are to be salt. We are to be a preserver of the things that God has given us to preserve. So in this message, I don't want to go through all the details of preterism and these three prophetic points of view. But I will say at this point, I hold the more historicist point of view because I think it's more accurate and it makes more sense, at least at this point in time. And uh, it, uh, I have some books and some study stuff that I'd recommend you all if you all are interested in to look into it more. So, full preterism and dispensational futurism I do not agree with. Although they, both sides, or at least the preterism side, they have points that are valid to what we're going to talk about today. But you'll find that a lot of them are distorted, at least in my opinion. They have a lot of holes in their doctrine, and when you start asking about them, you know, it gets even more confusing. But we all have holes in our doctrine, so it's not a bad thing to look into these things. That way you can understand the other person's side. So I started studying Matthew 24 to figure out what was going on in this chapter because the preterists say this has all been fulfilled. And when you read it, you're like, hmm, okay, maybe they're onto something. But when you dig in, there's just a little bit more to the surface. Uh, when you start looking at that chapter and other chapters and verses, they don't harmonize with the rest of the Bible. But those good points that they make need to harmonize. Full preterism has become very popular. I don't know how many sermons and books I've gotten sent or recommended in just the last six months. Um, very popular. And uh, sometimes the people are very kind and, you know, they're just trying to share truth with you. Other times they're very rude, blatant, and, uh, you know, they, they think, act like you're stupid for believing Jesus is going to come back. You know, you idiot. What are you talking about? Haven't you read the Bible? Just read the Bible is the attitude they have. But... That doesn't mean what they say isn't true, so you've got to go look it out and see. You know, just because they're rude about it and they think they're, they know everything doesn't mean they may not have a point. So we need to go look and see what they say, if it's true or not. So I even had one fella call me a Judeo-Christian because in one of the messages I referred to Jesus coming back and, and setting things in order. And I asked him about it because I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, I would like to know what his line of thinking is on this. When I asked him, he told me because I believed in the second coming of Jesus in the future, and that made me a Judeo-Christian. It was news to me. I never heard of that before. <laughs> so anyways, so you have futurism, historicism, and preterism. There's more, but those are the main two that I want, uh, three I want to talk about today, or I want us to keep in mind when we're looking at these passages. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and His disciples came to Him for, to show Him the building of the temple. This is right after Jesus went out of the temple and condemned the Judean Pharisees very harshly. He did not hold back any punches. He condemned them in their corrupt religious system of that day, their order, and that and they were there in Jerusalem in the temple. And in Matthew 23, 33, right before the disciples talked about this, Jesus said these words, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell or the grave? Pretty strong words, don't you think? I mean, he just gave them a good tongue lashing, walked out, and then he said these words. Verse 2, And Jesus said unto the disciples, or unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. We don't have to turn there, but I'll read it. The parallel verse to this chapter, this verse here is uh, Luke 22, 21, excuse me, Luke 21, verse 5 through 6, which states, And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in, the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, if you can imagine, Jesus just rebuked the, the Pharisees, their temple, everything, called them a den of vipers. And, you know, they're all going to go to hell. 
You're all going to die. And then the disciples come out and said, Oh, look how beautiful this temple is. Look how wonderful it is. And then Jesus said, There ain't going to be none of it left. It's all going to be destroyed. Every stone, they're not even going to be on top of each other when it's destroyed. It was an amazing building. Uh, it was the second creation of the temple. And about 30 years before, prior to that, uh, Herod the Great, which is the one that slaughtered all the babies in, Jerusalem, or in Bethlehem, had adorned it. He had renovated it and made it amazing. It was a very amazing structure for the world at that time. And he meant it would be utterly destroyed. I mean, a big statement. Because this was the house of God. What do you mean it will be destroyed? And we know through history that the Romans destroyed the temple and Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Much of his, uh, the history of this event can be read in Josephus, which was a Judean historian at the time. And it's heavy reading, but it is fascinating history. Uh, because you get to see what happened in the lives of those people. Now Jesus said that not one stone would set upon another, and that is exactly what happened. When they came through, there was not one stone, and to this day there is not one stone. Even the people that want to rebuild the temple, there's still not one stone. The Wailing Wall isn't even part of that temple. They go over there and knock their heads off. It is a retaining wall from another construction altogether. The temple is just a pile of rubble, still there. And, and a lot of it has been used for quarry material. So it's not even... there's nothing left. The temple platform at the time was shaped like a big square. And it was 600 feet by 600 feet in size, which is 360 square feet. Josephus said the whole structure was the height of what we would deem a modern skyscraper, sky, do a skyscraper uh, 40 to 45 stories tall from the very low of the Kidron Valley. So it was a massive building. You could have been seen it from a long way. And Jerusalem wasn't that big compared to some of our modern cities today. It wasn't huge. But this, you had this big, talling temple up in the middle of it. And uh, so it's 40 to 45 stories above the extreme depths of the Kidron Valley on the east and at the northern uh, corner of the retaining wall. Josephus said the eastern wall of the temple exceeded all descriptions and words. The eastern wall is where they had all the adorning and stones, gold. You know, it was a lot of money put into it. But the temple was utterly destroyed anyway, just like Jesus had said. After the temple was burned in 70 A.D., Titus, the Roman general, we talked about him in my, the last message, about being the prince that was spoken about in the book of uh, Daniel. He ordered the very foundation to be uplifted from the temple. Now think about that. This is 70 A.D. They didn't have dozers. That is manual labor, slaves, uh, soldiers out there lifting up the foundation. And they dug it up, after which the ground on which it was stood was plowed up. It's interesting to note that Titus didn't want to destroy the temple. He did not want to destroy it at first. Um, he wanted to preserve it, and he had uh, sent Josephus to the other Judeans and again try to persuade them to surrender, and they, weren't, they didn't want to surrender. But one greater than Titus, that being God, had determined it otherwise. There was no getting around it. There was no preserving it. It was going to be destroyed. According to Josephus, one Roman soldier, neither waiting for any command nor trembling at such an attempt, but urged, but a certain divine impulse had went through him. One could say, mounting the soldiers of his companions, thrust a burning brand in at a golden window, and thereby set fire to the building of the temple itself. Titus ran immediately to the temple and commanded the soldiers to extinguish the fire, but nothing could restrain their violence and rage. Neither could they, uh, neither, they neither could not or would not hear. Now you got to realize their probability of getting slaughtered by their general after that was high. This wasn't the U.S. Army. They, he could have killed them, but they disobeyed. Titus commanded his soldiers to be beaten for disobeying him, but their anger and hatred for the Judeans and a certain warlike fury that overcame them, uh, overcame their reverence for their general and their dread of his command. The temple was burned, and then they set the city afire. Now this all didn't happen in one day. It was a long, it was a couple years siege, but this main skirmish happened over a couple months. 
And uh, there's a video on YouTube. You can search the Jerusalem siege. Guy did a little animation of the battle, and the siege is very interesting. It'll give you a more visual idea of what was happening. So all the rest of the city was demolished and leveled with the ground, and they that who came to Jerusalem after it happened didn't believe that anybody had ever inhabited the land. It was that bad. So you imagine a metropolis, trade center, big temple, and then people coming and like, I didn't even know anybody lived here. Now let's look at verse 3, Matthew chapter 24. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying... So this is a little time afterwards, however long it took them to leave the temple and go out to the Mount of Olives. And he's alone with his disciples, so obviously there was people there with him in the last chapter. So there was witnesses. They heard him say, it's all going to be destroyed. So the disciples are now asking him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So we'll stop there. First off, the word world here doesn't mean world. It means age. And if you're reading a New American Standard, it'll say that. At least I believe it does. And a lot of other translations will as well. This is not talking about the end of the world, the end of the planet. It's talking about the end of the age. When was the end of the age? The destruction of this temple. And uh, this is where the King James got it wrong. You know, I use the King James a lot because people, most people use it. But they, they got it wrong here, along with a lot of other stuff. There's no perfect Bible translation. So after Jesus said what He did about the destruction of the temple, remember that all that was being discussed was the destruction of the temple. Not the end of the world, not the second coming, the destruction of the temple. And then they asked Him privately, when were these things going to happen? So the parallel verse to this is Luke 21, verse 7. And it says here, And they asked him, saying, Master, when shall these things be, and what, shall, what sign will be when these things shall come to pass? We're still talking about the destruction of the temple and the destruction of this religious system. We're not talking about the end of the world here. Just the end of the age that is marked by the destruction of this temple. Let's also look at Matthew chapter thir excuse me, Mark chapter 13, verse 4, which is another parallel verse to this one in Matthew. Quote, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign when all these things be fulfilled? So Jesus, they come out of the temple, Jesus says, Hey, this temple is going to be destroyed, and they're like, When's this going to happen? Not the end of the world. And we'll talk about that term, thy coming, shortly. It doesn't mean what everybody thinks it means. Now notice, in all these verses, including Matthew chapter 24, the subject being discussed is the destruction of the temple, not the second coming of Jesus. Jesus was talking about the temple being destroyed, and in the context of the conversation, the disciples were asking when it was going to happen. It should also be noted that the disciples didn't understand Jesus' whole plan for dying, being resurrected, and then ascending, and then coming back. He told them, and He gave them hints. But they didn't understand, or they would have been sitting outside the tomb on the third day. But instead, they were afraid. And in John chapter 20, verse 19, they were afraid up in the upper room because they were afraid the Jews were going to come in and kill them. If they had really understood what He was talking about, they would have been just sitting there watching their watches, waiting for the tomb to open up. If they had, it would have been totally different. Wouldn't you have been there? If Jesus told you, hey, I'm going to die, and then on the third day I'm going to come back, i have been waiting outside the tomb if I understood what He was talking about. But they obviously didn't. It was Peter who rebuked Jesus for even talking about being killed in Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus called him a Satan and an adversary. Pretty harsh words. He didn't understand. What would be the point? Okay, you're going to be killed, but you're going to come back? Peter didn't understand. A point in the context of this passage does not, it does not tell us why the disciples would be asking about His second coming and thy coming. When they were talking about the destruction of the temple, when they didn't fully even realize the whole plan. And that's something for us to remember too. We don't understand everything that's going to happen in the future. We understand some of it, but even the old prophets that had prophecies of Jesus coming, they didn't understand the details. It was never given to them. 
So I'll address this term, thy coming, sign of thy coming, when we get to verse 30. But right now, I'll just shelve that for a minute and we'll, we'll move on and get to that when we get to verse 30, which will be in the next message, uh, which is why it's very important for the next message to be heard to understand what this chapter is all about. Now let's look at verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5 of Matthew 24. And it says here, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So, here we have Jesus wanting them to let them know that let no man deceive them, that there would be false Christ. People come to deceive them. And we have them today, too. It wasn't just between 33 A.D. and 70 A.D. These false Christs were to appear before the destruction of the temple, not saying, like I said, that we were, they're not here today, but because we do, but in this passage is talking about 70 A.D., between there and then. There are several examples of imposters mentioned in the book of Acts, one being Simon the sorcerer. I know we've all read about him of Samaria, who had bewitched the people of Samaria, making him to be one that is great according to Acts chapter 8, verse 10 through 11. Uh, Irenus, which was a historian, wrote in the second century concerning Simon, this man, quote, this man was glorified by many as if he were a god. And he taught that it was himself who appeared among the Judeans as the son and descended into Samaria as the father while he came to another nation somewhere else, another nation in character of the Holy Spirit, end quote. So here we go, a false Christ. He said he was Christ. He acted like Christ. People believed he was Christ. They were bewitched by him. It is also said that Simon went to Rome at some point and was honored with a statue that had an inscription under it that said, To Simon, the holy God. Now they had plenty of gods. They didn't mind adding one or two. Uh, they would have added Jesus if he fell in line with their way of thinking and didn't go against their system. Irenus also, said, also wrote about a disciple and successor to Simon called Meandra, who made similar claims saying he had been sent into the world as a savior for the deliverance of man. Another false Christ. Proving that this passage was fulfilled. There was also uh, several others that appeared at this period in time, but we won't go into all of them, who, considered, who would be considered a false Christ. Now let's go to verse 6, verse six, chapter, Matthew chapter 24. And it says here, And ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars, and see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, I know we have wars and rumors of wars today, and this can be seen today, and it has the last 2,000 years. But this passage was not talking about today in this passage. We see it today. It's obvious that there hadn't been a time in history there hadn't been wars and rumors of wars. But what Jesus is saying is there's going to be wars and rumors of wars during this period in time. It's important to note again and remember, the end here mentioned is not the end of the world. The end of the age, the destruction, 70 A.D., the destruction of the temple. Josephus records several events of wars and rumors of wars concerning Rome and the surrounding area of Judea during this time. Jesus' point was that when you see these wars and conflicts happening, and these rumors or hear of wars that might happen, don't let those distract you from what is happening. It's not the end yet, not the end of the age. Don't let them distract you. Now, let's go to verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and drivers' places. End quote. Now, at this point in time, there was lots of conflicts. If you read about the Roman, that period in time, oh my goodness, it was terrible. I mean, the Roman, just the Roman Empire itself, they had a new emperor all the time because the other one had killed them. 
Or his mother killed it. Or his son killed it. And then, you know, Cassie and I were watching a documentary a few uh, weeks ago on all the construction projects in Rome. Every time one emperor died, you know, they'd come in and just wipe the earth clean. And then they would, you know, do all this stuff. And then they would, there'd be wars. And it just, it was amazing, all the stuff that was going on. Now, everything in this verse happens today, too. But that's not what he was saying in the passage. He was saying these things are going to happen between here and there. And there are to be signs of what's going to happen. So, uh, at this point in time, there was many conquests. Rome was expanding. And they, they expanded all the way up to Britain. And they went up to the uttermost edge of Britain. So if you can imagine the Roman Empire, it stretched from Egypt all the way up to Britain. That's a huge area. Almost all Europe and all the what we call the Middle East and the Mediterranean was Roman rule. Lots of battles during that time, during the reign of Nero, and Rome engaged in a war with Parthia, Parthia and Armenia at the time. But pertaining to the Judeans, there were Judean colonies that experienced a lot of hostility in several places, not just in, in the Middle East, but also in, uh, in Babylon. There was Judean uh, campments and settlements in Babylon, and there was a lot of harassment and violence and war, and then, uh, and then later a war. There was a conflict with the Judeans and the, Syri uh, the, uh, the Assyrians in uh, Cyrene about the time Paul was imprisoned during, uh, by the governor Felix in Matthew chapter 20, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 24. There was no lack of nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom during this time. What about famine in this passage? Well, during this time, there was a lot of famine in lots of places because that's a consequence of war. You have war, you have famine. Uh, without going to every single one of them, which we wouldn't be able to, Jerusalem seen famine leading up to 70 A.D. and, of course, during the siege. And then Rome had a huge food storage during the reign of Claudius. Concerning pestilence, according to Tacitus, which was a Roman historian, a non-Christian Roman historian, said Rome had a large sickness where, quote, the houses were full of corpses and streets of funerals. Neither sex nor age conferred immunity. Slave or free all succumbed just as suddenly. So this, is, uh, this was around, I believe, uh, I didn't write it down, around 45 A.D., some say in Rome over 30,000 recorded dead just during this one little incident. And many think it was much more. There's also a reports that uh, there was a sickness in Babylon which also urged the Judeans to get out of that area during that time as well. well what about earthquakes? Well, there's always earthquakes, but there was a lot of earthquakes during this time. Uh, just to name a few, there was a great earthquake in 46 A.D. accompanied by another one that shook the whole island of Crete and surrounding areas. During that earthquake, the earth surrounding the coast of Crete receded a mile, and a new island arose up out in the sea to the north. In 51 A.D., during the famine of Rome, there were repeated earthquakes that flattened houses and damaged cities. So you had famine, earthquakes, everything going on. Two years later, there was an earthquake in Asia Minor that destroyed the city of Ampia. The destruction was so bad, the, gov the Roman government gave them a three-year remission from taxes. Now that was bad. Rome liked their taxes. In 60 AD, there was another bad earthquake in the city of Laodicea. Same Laodicea where the church was. The famous city of Pompeii was also struck with a bad earthquake in 62 A.D. It is believed it would have been 5 to 6 on the Richter scale. Now, I don't know much about earthquakes, but I looked it up. To give you an idea how big that is, the 1811 and 1812 New Madrid earthquake that was north of here in uh, Kentucky, between Kentucky and Missouri, that earthquake was a 7.2. And that earthquake made the Mississippi River flow in the opposite direction for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Pompeii, which we all know was destroyed, was destroyed in 60, uh, excuse me, 79 A.D., just a few short years later, and 20,000 people were killed. So there was lots of earthquakes, lots of famines, lots of pestilence, and lots of wars and rumors of wars during this time. 
Now let's go to verse 8. We're going to read through verse 8 through 13 in this section here. Jesus speaking to His disciples and the Christians of that time, but mainly to His disciples, "...all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and, you shall, and shall kill you." Now I'll stop there. Man, that would have been a, a blow. Jesus just said, hey, you're going to be delivered up and then they're going to kill you. And we know that all but one of the disciples or the apostles were killed, murdered, martyred. Let's continue on. And ye shall be hated of all nations, or all ethnoses, for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. Now these six verses don't require much context or review. We know because all the apostles were killed but John, who was given the book of Revelation. They were all murdered and martyred. Early Christians were afflicted, tortured, hated, and murdered for the service of Jesus Christ. We all know this. There was also many false prophets in those days that tried to, quote, deceive the elect with false doctrine. If we read in Galatians chapter 1, verse 7, it was Paul who said this, quote, There be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. This was during that time. And, like I said, we have the same thing happening today. Let's look at verse 14. Verse 14. This one here, this one here is amazing, and it's often misunderstood. It says here in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto, unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, I love this verse because it really talks about the expansion of the gospel during that period, which is more expansive than many realize. It. This verse has been misinterpreted to mean the whole planet which the atheists use as a contradiction because we all know that the Eskimos up in Alaska did not receive the gospel before 70 A.D., nor has everyone now received the gospel, if you want to look at it that way. This verse is also uh, used to, as a proof that the Bible is inaccurate uh, because no one would believe that. Many futurists also take this verse as unfulfilled, and that everything after this verse in Matthew chapter 24 is unfulfilled. This is why so many churches promote mission trips to the deepest, darkest parts of wherever. And they've been getting killed during that time too and eaten and everything else. This is why. They believe that in order for Jesus to come back, the gospel has to go to all the deep, dark parks of Africa and the jungles of South America and everything because of this. But if you look at this as all being fulfilled in 70 AD, we know that... It doesn't make any sense either if you include the whole world as being the whole planet. But let's look at the verse again. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Let's stop there and ask ourselves, what world is he speaking about? Is he speaking about the whole planet? This word world here is not cosmos, but oye koi min a in the Greek. I butchered that, I know. It's Strong's 3625, if you want to look it up. It almost always refers to the land of Rome or Greek, the Greek land, the Roman land. To, for an example of how that's so, look at Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it says here, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world be taxed. Now, did he tax the Eskimos? Did he tax the Africans? Did he tax the Chinese? The Romans knew about the Chinese. I mean, there was, there was trade, a, a little trade between them. They knew they existed. But did he really tax them? Did he tax the whole world? No. He taxed the Roman land. That word in the Greek is referring to the Roman land. So, this word is talking about the, the land or region under the Roman Empire or the land under those people's control. And in the Middle East, like I said before, the Middle East all the way up to Britain. And uh, they had a pretty big presence in Britain, which is a long way from Rome. It's a historical fact 
that the gospel was preached throughout all of Europe before 70 AD, even Europe and Britain. It spread like wildfire over that short 40-year period from the death of Jesus and His resurrection and His ascension to 70 AD. It was preached unto all the nations, the nations of Israel, the dispersed nations. Uh, the commenter, Adam Clark, uh, in his 18, I think it was 1830 commentary, uh, concerning this passage stated this, quote, The gospel was not only preached in the lesser Asia and Greece and Italy, the greatest treatise of action then in the world, but was likewise propagated as far as Scythia. Now, I'll stop there. If y'all don't know where that is, that is like uh, the eastern Russia. So, think Black Sea and upward. As far as Ethiopia, as east as Parthia and India, and as far west as Spain and Britain. And on this point, Bishop Newton goes on to say that there is some probability that the gospel was preached in British nations by St. Simon, the apostle, and there is much greater probability that it was preached here by St. Paul and that there is an absolute certain certainty that it was planted here in the time of the apostles before the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, if you want a really good presentation on that, I have a DVD back there by Charles Jennings. Uh, Did St. Paul, or the Apostle Paul, visit Britain? It's a very, very professionally done documentary. i got a stack of them there. Uh, if I run out, let me know and I'll make you another copy. It, it, it proves it. Uh, it's a fact. And a lot of the people that live over there, they understand that. So the gospel was preached to the entire world and to all the nations in the context of this passage. The nations he was speaking of are the tribes of Israel that were dispersed into Europe after their captivity. The same people who took the gospel and the new covenant and accepted it. That new covenant was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. They were his people and he was their God. Now, the Judeo-Christian mindset states that the Jews over there are still waiting to be accepted. They're still... They still haven't accepted Jesus. We, we, we need to go talk to them and preach to them. It's been 2,000 years already. The people that were said to be His, be His people and He be their God have already taken it. That's one of the biggest proofs of who Israel is, is who accepted the gospel. Now, back on to the gospel being preached to the whole world. Let's turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 18. Now, this is Paul speaking in the book of Romans. And he's talking in past tense. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. This, I mean, this sound they heard, and speaking of the gospel, by the way, in the context, this sound, any sound at that, had any sound or word went from where Paul was writing this unto the entire planet. No, not in the context of the way we interpret it in the Judeo-Christian mindset. Now let's turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. But it was fulfilled in true under the interpretation of the word world as meaning the Roman land, the Grecian empire, the, the Grecian land, the people that were inhabited that. Now let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, and it says here, If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made minister. Now this last passage is not talking about the gospel being preached to bugs. It's a figure of speech. He is talking about it was preached to everywhere it needed to go. And uh, I'm sure somewhere out there takes that literally and they're out there talking to a bug on the ground. Just like they're baptizing dogs and everything else. <laughs> so, what about the end in this passage? The same end that was spoken about at the very beginning of the chapter. The end of the age. 
the end which marked the age was the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, the wicked, corrupt religious system that was destroyed at that time. This is not speaking of the planet, but the end of the age up to this point. So, we're going to stop there, and we're going to finish back up in verse 15 after lunch, the abomination of desolation, which it just talks about in verse 15. And what that was in more detail. I know in my last message I didn't touch on that much. And uh, I'm going to touch on it a little bit more here. You could do a whole message on it, but I'm going to tell you what it was or what I believe it was and how it harmonizes with this entire chapter.